So you've been hearing about insulin resistance, but you're not entirely sure what the heck it is or how it affects you as a person with diabetes. In this video, I'll be going over what insulin resistance is, the reasons for it, and some action steps for lowering your insulin resistance. My name is Rachel. I am a registered nurse and certified diabetes care and education specialist, and I have worked with countless clients that are dealing with insulin resistance, including myself, and we figured out some ways to help them increase their insulin sensitivity. Let's talk about what insulin resistance is. Insulin resistance happens when the cells in your muscles, fat, and liver don't respond appropriately to a hormone called insulin. A quick review of what insulin does and how it works in your body. Insulin is like a key and your cells are a lock, right? Glucose is important and essential for our body to get energy and do all the fabulous things that it needs to do throughout the day. In order to get that energy or that glucose into cells, we need insulin to unlock the cell. When we have insulin resistance, it is as if somebody changed those locks and forgot to get a new set of keys. So we got a bunch of keys circulating and there's no way to get the glucose into those cells. When a person is insulin resistant, they begin to have higher blood sugars as well as higher insulin levels. This is the hallmark sign of type two diabetes, although this can happen to people with type one diabetes as well, except in their case, they don't have high circulating levels of endogenous insulin because their pancreas no longer makes it. We still don't know what causes insulin resistance, but we do know that it is multifactorial, which means there are a ton of different reasons for it, and they all play into this result of becoming insulin resistant. A large part of insulin resistance is inherited. A heritability of insulin sensitivity ranges from 37% to 55%. I tell my clients, insulin resistant is kind of like a gift from your ancestor. It was passed on through generations to help people keep on fat and survive famine. Another factor is age. As we get older, our adipose tissue or fat tissue increases and our muscle tissue decreases. This unfortunately leads to increased insulin resistance in everybody as they age because it can be a lot harder to manipulate that body composition as it was when you were younger. Stress is another notable factor in insulin resistance. Stress causes systemic inflammation which leads to insulin resistance. Chronic stress at work or at home or just life in general can be especially detrimental because this creates chronic insulin resistance and unfortunately is a lot of the time what leads to type two diabetes. Another thing we don't often consider is that overfeeding and underfeeding AKA yo-yo dieting creates some weight fluctuations and added stress on the body. So the act of dieting to prevent diabetes oftentimes can actually make the insulin resistance worse if we are restricting in a way that leads to weight fluctuations regularly. It's also important to note that certain medications can cause insulin resistance. Medications that people need to take for lupus or transplants Steroids especially cause significant resistance, and if you're taking them regularly, this can lead to chronic insulin resistance. Doesn't mean that you shouldn't take these medications, but it is important to be aware of. Some other medications that can cause insulin resistance that people take regularly are antipsychotics, as well as medications that people take for myasthenia gravis and certain conditions like that. Of course, the public health police on social media is going to come for me and be like, Rachel, what the fuck about diet? And yes, 
I saved diet for last because I think it's the first thing we go to when we're trying to find a reason for insulin resistance. And I do want you all to remember that, again, this is a multifactorial sort of condition that the body is in, which means that diet does play a part alongside all these other ones that we've talked about. Diets high in saturated fat and really low in fiber are proven or have been proven to cause significant insulin resistance. Physical inactivity is also a very important player in the development of insulin resistance. Physical exercise has the potential to reduce weight fluctuations, reduce inflammation, upregulate mechanisms governing physiological antioxidant generation, and drastically increase cellular sensitivity to endogenous or exogenous insulin. To summarize, here are some of the factors that cause insulin resistance. Age, genetics, weight fluctuations, stress, sedentary lifestyle, diets high in saturated fat and low in fiber, and certain medications like antipsychotics and steroids. Some of these things we don't have control over. We really can't control our genetic makeup. We can't control the things that happen to us as we age. And we really can't control the medications we need to take for other conditions that require our care. So let's talk about the things that are within our ability to manipulate and decrease our risk for significant insulin resistance. Joyful movement. I preach and I preach and I preach and I preach this all over social media and with my client. I don't care how you're moving or what you're doing. I just want you to start moving. I think a lot of us have been working from home as of late and this makes it difficult to get in that daily movement that we used to get in. Ask yourself every day, what would feel good right now if I wanted to move my body? This could be gardening, doing some yard work, going up and down your stairs, getting an under desk elliptical or treadmill to use while you're working. All of these things are fantastic ideas and all movement counts. So don't put too much pressure on yourself in the beginning if you're just starting and getting in some exercise. The more you move consistently, the more you can reap those insulin sensitizing benefits. Second, Balance your plate. The diabetes plate method is a really great example of this. Add to half of your plate non-starchy vegetables like broccoli, lettuce, you know, a salad, cauliflower, onions, all of these good and high fiber vegetables that you enjoy. The next quarter of your plate is going to be carbohydrates or starches. This could be beans or rice or quinoa or barley or whatever the heck you enjoy that tends to have a little bit more carbs in there. You can, you can stick it in that quarter, quarter of the plate. The last quarter of the plate, aim to add your lean protein serving. Protein helps keep you full and can help steady out your blood sugars as well. Remember, you don't have to eat fiber that tastes bad to you. If you really hate kale or collard greens or I don't know, I'm, I hate broccoli pretty much more than anything, don't feel pressured to put that on your plate. If you wanna eat the same vegetables all the time, go for it. It really is about building a plate that you enjoy and eating the foods that you love. As long as you are making sure that you are balancing and enjoying yourself. If you take anything away from this video, I want it to be managing your stress levels. I personally definitely notice the effects of high stress on my blood sugars. For example, when I worked in bedside nursing, which was one of the most traumatic and crazy times of my entire life, my blood sugars just did not really wanna stay in range no matter how much insulin I took. And I was highly insulin resistant during this time because I was under chronic stress. I was gaining a bunch of weight, which compounded the issue as well. And it was just a lot. I thankfully had the opportunity to find a new job that worked really well for me. I know a lot of people don't have that opportunity. So I highly recommend either seeing if you can finding a therapist to talk with or maybe using a cognitive behavioral therapy app that you can find in the app store to sort of help you figure out ways to de-stress, whether that's through meditation or thought management, these are all really good options. 
I will leave some links and resources in the description below for mental health resources for people with diabetes. One of those is actually a course that I am coming out with, which is all about thought management and developing and building resilience alongside your relationship with your diabetes. Now, if you wanna learn more about these action steps and how to use them in a mindful way when it comes to your diabetes self-management, I have a whole nother video dedicated to this topic. So go ahead and go over there and watch that video. If you have not already subscribed to this channel, please do because there's lots of good diabetes goodies coming your way. I will talk to you again soon.